Last week, uh, I talked a little bit about Inquirer's class, and uh, Inquirer's class is what some churches call new members class. Uh, we like to emphasize that this is a safe place to ask questions, so we, we uh, maintain and hold on to that older Presbyterian term, Inquirer's class. Any questions? If you feel like I'm going too fast, you have anything, it's like a like an auction, you know, you don't even have to go, ooh, ooh, you can just kind of pull your ear or something like that, and I'll see it, and I'll say, yes, question. So just feel free to ask any question, and uh, we will not embarrass you no matter how uh, dumb the question really is. <laughs> but even if you ask a really dumb question, we'll make you think it's smart. All right, so feel free, please, to ask anything at any point. Um, this course is... Uh, using a framework from one verse of the Bible that talks about the priorities and activities of the earliest church that was called a Christian church. We, we uh, believe the church started in the Garden of Eden, so we, we're not, we don't believe the church started in, uh, at Pentecost, but at Pentecost when the, the church was truly a Christian church uh, because they called themselves after the Christ, Christ. After that, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they were continuously devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And so those are the four pillars of this class, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Acts 2, 47, you can look it up. And um, that will be the framework that we use to structure our thoughts in this particular class. Um, if you are here for the first time, you have a little card that looks like that. Does it have a couple questions on it, Axel? Name, address, phone number. Okay. There's another card that I think it's like um, school bus orange color. Yeah. There you go. All right. If you guys could just take a moment or two right now to fill that out. The other guys uh, filled it out last week, but if you'll fill that out for me. It's basically three questions. Your name. And then the next question is, have you come to the place in your spiritual journey where you know for certain that if you died, you would go to heaven? And lastly, why do you think that's true? In other words, what would you say to God if he actually asked you that question? Why should I allow you to come into my heaven? When I was in Presbyterian or seminary, I went to Missy and I went to a Presbyterian church like ours in Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, we were in a new members class that was full of seminary students. So like 20 seminary students. So when they came to ask these very questions that I'm asking you on that card, 
people were saying, I, could I have a third card? And just continuing to write everything so precisely and so like philosophically correct. So we're not looking for that, just straight answers. All right, everybody done with those cards? Can Kathy, would you take those for me? Thank you. All right, now I want to, um, last week I told you a little bit about my own story. That is my, my history with the apostles' teaching. This week, uh, and I started this last week, but I want to continue to talk about what is the apostles' teaching. The um, short word for it is gospel. Uh, in the Greek language, it's you and gelion, you like euthanasia, meaning good death, you uh, or euphemism, um, meaning good. Uh, so it's a good message, angelon, like angel, you angelion, evangelical or um, evangel, that's the word that we translate as good news. I want to start off at the beginning again, kind of go very quickly for where we were last week, and then uh, uh, finish on, on that. So this is, if you want to follow along, you can follow in your book on page three. There's four little pictures there, and everybody loves pictures. So Okay, so we start off uh, our, our story of the Bible um, with the fact that God created us and God created all things by the word of his power, as the Bible says. We're the only uh, ones that are created in the image of God. And uh, someone, someone once said that you could illustrate it like this. Like this is God. If that's an equilateral triangle, I know it's not, not a good one. but And then this is a... Giraffe, and then this is a redwood tree, and this is the planet Mercury. So these are all uh, the creations of God. So how would you then illustrate man or humanity? Josh, take a stab at it. Okay, smaller equilateral triangle. That, that's a good guess. What would you say? Anyone? It's not so much, Josh is on the right track. It's not so much that we're just a small God. Our illustration would be like, well, like this, like a right triangle. Still a triangle. Uh, like none of the other shapes are, but not exactly a miniature of God. Uh, Nietzsche said that, you know, God in the mind of the West has been like Ubermensch, you know, like Superman. And uh, we're not just, God is not just us on steroids. You know, he's not just us as a superhero. We're not exactly like God, but we're like God in a way that none of the other creatures could be said to be like God. And that's what the Bible means when it says that we are made in the image of God. All right, so God makes us in his image. And then um, I, I said last week, he enters into a contract with us. Uh, I, I know you, and, um, but I've never had a contract with you, Anna, have I? We've never signed papers together. Uh, sometimes we do that. Uh, we take vows to one another, like when we uh, sell a piece of property or we enter into a marriage agreement that's like a kind of a contract but normally our agreements with one another go unstated so as I said last week Bonnie and I are friends but we know that even though we've never signed papers about this that I could never say hey Bonnie how you doing let me take off your glasses and then I go boop and just poke her in the eye she would know that's against the social unstated social contract of human interactions here in South Florida. But God didn't allow his 
agreement with us to go unstated. He actually states it, and then he immediately gives us a mechanism by which we can tell whether we're in the boundaries of the contract or not. And if you look at page three, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that little uh, symbol there, a little picture. There's God, and God gave us a contract, and there's man, and there's the boundaries of the contract, that circle, okay? And basically, the contract said, we will conduct our relationship by truth. And that means I'll be the creator, because that's who I am. You be the cre creation, because that's who you are. And if ever our relationship slips into unreality or untruth, the relationship will be broken. And the way God actually, the mechanism God actually gave them was, there's all these beautiful and amazing trees, good for food in the garden. You can eat from any of them, but this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat on pain of death, all right? The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, is this a symbol or whatever? Well, we're not really concerned about that. People have looked into this. They, is this like a sexuality thing? You know, what really was break? I'm putting all that aside, just taking it as a basic truth that we're looking at right there. And God is basically saying, I'll be the creator, you be the creature. If you think you know better than I am, or if you get it into your head, I think we made God, not that God made us. The covenant will be broken, the contract will be smashed, and cosmic untruth will enter into our relationship, and I'm not going to let that happen. The way that I uh, characterized this last week, or summarized it, is in these words. Obey and live, disobey and die. Here's Adam and Eve. They are designated in the Bible as representatives of the human race. However they act in the garden, you act, because they're acting on your behalf. Just like a federal representative might vote in Washington, D.C. in a way that you don't like, but if he votes for you, it's as if you personally voted for it. It's a federal relationship or a representative relationship. Adam and Eve were given that one command, obey and live, disobey and die. Did they keep the command? Hmm? They did not. He's trying to freak you out. They did not. How many times did they have to break the command before it was considered actually broken? Once? Yes, once. Kaylee said, man, I've been around the block with you, Pastor TJ. I know how this is going. Uh, yes, one time uh, it was broken. And I've, I said last week, uh, I'll, we'll, I will never forget being in the office with a guy who was a lifelong Presbyterian in another country. And he said, when you said that, for one sin, the covenant was broken. My mouth dropped open. And he said, I'd, I'd seen it a million times, but it never really dawned on me. And all of a sudden I realized that I, on my own efforts, cannot be in the presence of God. One sin will disqualify you. It's not to say that all sins are equally bad, except that all sins are equally condemnable. All right? um, if I hate a person... It's like committing murder against the person, but then if I actually go and buy a gun and ammunition and take lessons at a shooting range or whatever and actually carry it out, that sin obviously is worse. But all sins are condemnable and as, as we see in the garden. So Adam and Eve go from obey and live to disobey and die. And when they did that, if we had a video camera with a microphone in the garden, what we would have seen is that immediately after they sinned, they run, they hide, they cover, and they blame. They run, hide, cover, and blame. And uh, it's basically the same thing that we're doing 
right to the present day. Uh, if someone shows up late to a meeting, they feel like a little tiny twinge of shame. And if they're asked to give an account why they're late, they almost never reflexively, that is, the words that just come right out of their mouth, they almost never tell the truth. It's really a small breach of the social contract, right? When we're late, okay, we're late. But when I say to you, Joseph, why were you late? And then we feel shame. We say, Kaylee shut off the alarm clock, right? Or the traffic was murder. Or right after we left, the rain was so bad, we had to pull over. And all these things may have happened, but they may not really be the reason why we were late. So what we do is we take a small breach of the social contract, and then we compound it by adding lies to it, you see? And uh, so that, that's how we are. To this present day, what we saw reflected in the garden is the way to this very day we respond to getting caught. We run, hide, cover, and blame. I just want you guys to know that because even if this is the only class you attend, if you'll just go into life knowing that, like, you know, when you go to the doctor and they hit you and they check your reflexes, it's reflexive. We do it without even thinking about it. We will run, hide, cover, and blame always to cover our sin. And we're going to see it's the worst thing you can do in order to grow as a Christian. The best thing you can do, as we often say, is come out with your hands up, and if you start to tell the truth in the, in, in the presence of God, which is called uh, homologion in the Greek. Homo meaning the same, logion meaning word. If you say the same word about your sin that God says, which is translated into the English as confess, if you confess your sins, you'll begin to grow at a, at a great rate. If you cover your sins, hide, blame, justify, and try to put it on other people, you will, your growth will come to a screeching halt in the Christian life. All right, so back to this. Adam and Eve sin. They're ejected from the garden. That's made abundantly clear by the fact that an angel is stationed at the garden with a flaming sword not to let them back into the garden. Now, um, what, what happens is we... We get that message that I, for one sin, am pushed out of the presence of God, and there's an angel guarding the way back into the presence of God, reminding me all the time that I don't deserve the presence of God. And we can't imagine that we're actually in this category. So we find ingenious ways to somehow convince ourselves that we're in the top tier. And the main uh, mechanism that we use for that is called comparison. We compare ourselves to other people. Like we see a homeless guy on the side of the road, and we think, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not really like that guy. Right? And um, one of the ways we do it is we always are able to find someone who's a little worse off than we are morally. All right, I have a little illustration about this. I'll try to go quickly. You know, um, you know what zero lot line is? Zero lot line? It's, it's the way they build condos here in South Florida that your, your uh, self-standing building might be right up against your neighbor's there's actually like a walkway between you, but that might be it. Your, your houses are basically right up against each other, even though they're self-standing separate houses. So I want you to imagine it's a, it's a spring day here in South Florida. It's like 68 degrees, which happens like once every decade or something, but it's 68 degrees. The windows are wide open in all these zero lot lines, and there's a couple. They just got married, and they're in the first house in the zero lot line. You, you get me, Josh? And so they're having an argument, they're newlyweds, and he says, I told you! And she says, did you, ju did, did you just raise your voice at me? And he's a newlywed, he just never saw it going in this direction, so he goes, he says, I just need a minute. 
goes into his bedroom, puts his head in his hands. He hears some, some screaming. It's the neighbors next door to him. The neighbor says, I told you, boop, says a curse word. And then that neighbor's wife says, huh, did you just raise your voice at me and use a curse word? And he says, I just need a moment. So he goes into his bedroom and he hears arguing next door. I told you, beep, curse word, and then throws a plate on the floor. And then he says, she says to him, did you just raise your voice, say a curse word, and drop a plate because of me? And he says, you know, I got to go, I need a minute. And it goes on and on and on and on and on until you get to Hitler, right? And then Hitler goes into his room and hears Attila the Hun or Genghis Khan or Joseph Stalin or whatever. In other words, yeah, Nero. So we always know about someone who's worse than us and we use that evidence to try to convince ourselves I'm probably not that bad. But God doesn't want us to live under that misnomer or that misunderstanding. And so God gives us a foolproof mechanism for discerning which tier we're in. All right? And the name of that mechanism is the law. All right? The law. The law, the moral law of God is summarized, at least in two places in the Bible. One place is Exodus chapter 20, and the other place is Deuteronomy chapter 5. And basically, the law condemns you at every point. All right? Um, does, does anyone know the Ten Commandments? Do you think you could me- you have the Ten Commandments memorized? Do you, Bonnie? All right. Now, now I got to say, Lutherans have a little bit of a di- different order in the Ten Commandments, um, but basically the, t- the same ten, just a little bit of an order. All right. So, how how you think you could recite them for us, or we, you don't you don't have to? I won't put you on the spot. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to give you guys an easy way to memorize the Ten Commandments. All right. And uh, this is super important, super great to memorize this. I found so many people want to have the Ten Commandments on the walls of the courthouses in our nation. And then you ask, do you know what they are? They say, "Uh, well, I'm not sure. So I'm going to give you now a way you can remember it the next time you're at a cocktail party or whatever. You can say, hey, I have the Ten Commandments memorized and people will be just floored. All right. All right. Number one is number one. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. All right, that's number one. Number two is don't make two. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. All right? Number three is the threefold name. Do you have a question? Oh, uh, a carved image. Graven, like engraved. A graven image of what? You shall not make an image of God, like a a statue, a, a statue or an idol. Yeah. All right, so again, number one. Is number one. Number two is don't make two. Number three is the threefold name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's, that's the way you can remember it. Number four, this is a little bit of a stretch, but he skips church. He goes to the golf course. He pulls back his club, and what does he say? Four. four. Fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You get it? I know it's a little stretch. Five. I should say that the commandments are basically divided between Godward commandments and manward commandments. You get it? So the first four commandments are really pertinent to God. No other gods before me. Don't make a graven image. Don't use my name the wrong way. Remember my day, right? The Sabbath day. Number five is the one that's kind of in the middle. I know. Go ahead. Did you have a question? No. Oh. Perfect. That's great. And that, that's exact, it's exactly my point. The one that's in the middle, and I know five isn't really in the middle between one to ten, but you can kind of think of it in the middle, is, is it Godward or manward? It's uh, honor your father and mother. The parent is the representative of God in the home, so it's kind of a Godward commandment. On the other hand, it's a human being, so it's a manward commandment. But it's kind of like 
halfway. So the fulcrum the, on the seesaw, the one in the middle, fifth commandment is remember, honor your father and mother. Right? So it's about authority. The sixth commandment is, and how do you remember that one? When you kill someone, how many feet under do you put them? Six feet under, right? You put them six feet under. Seven, she promises heaven. She'll not commit adultery. And in the, in the book of Proverbs, she says, come to my house, the, door, the steps to my house lead up to heaven. And the writer interjects, actually the steps to her house lead the other direction. They go down to, to Sheol or the grave. Seven, she promises heaven. It's another stretch here. Eight. And the pirates, when they stole the balloons, they called them pieces of, pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Another way I remember it, when I had to go through a confession as a child in the Catholic Church, you have to come in. You're in first grade, by the way. All right? So you're waiting in line like this. You have to keep your hands up because the nuns told you if you let your hands sink down like this, well, your prayers go down instead of going up. So you're, you're in line. You're completely freaked out. My dad, and you have to sit down on this little bench in this little booth, and you have to say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. This is my first confession. So my dad, who's a very serious Catholic and a super bad joker, says, T, when you get in there, say, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, stole a banana, and ate the skin. And so as I'm waiting, getting closer and closer, I'm sweating like, oh no, what if I say that? The priest is going to reach through and pull the lever, and I'm just going to go into hell or something. You know? So anyway, uh, stole a banana and ate. Get it? Eight? Yeah, shall not steal. Pieces of eight. All right, number nine. Not bear false witness. How do you remember that one? At the trials at Nuremberg, they asked the German SS officer, you did it. I tell you, you did it. Admit that you did it. And he said, what? Nine. Okay, so that's how you remember false witness, nine. And then 10. You see these jewels I'm giving you guys? Ten is he takes his ten greedy fingers and he wants more. Thou shalt not covet. All right, now you have the Ten Commandments. Now what do the Ten Commandments say about Josh or about Joseph or Anna or Bonnie or me? What do the Ten Commandments say, say to us? Well, oftentimes for me, and it's actually going to be in the sermon today for those of you who, who will hear that, um, when my alarm clock goes off, the first thought that I have is, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Is that your thought? Your first thought? Not, not that specific, but something like that. My first thought is, I need to hit the snooze button. <laughs> right? I mean, if we're honest, we're saying, man, I don't want to get up right now. It's too early. Uh, and so my first thought is not about God often. It's about myself. You know, uh, if I don't think, maybe if I do just jump right out of bed, my first thought is some sort of worrisome thought. Uh-oh, this is coming up this day. Am I prepared for it? Did I do enough to get ready? Blah, 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 blah. So oftentimes my first thoughts are not Godward, but, but me-ward, you know. Um, so something to think about. We can go right through the Ten Commandments and realize if we internalize them the way Jesus did, and he said, truly I say to you, you have heard that if you kill someone and two people see it, it's a capital crime. Jesus said, I tell you, if nobody sees it, if you didn't even do it, but just thought about doing it in your heart, if you hate a person in your heart, you've already committed murder. He said the same thing about adultery. I tell you, if you look upon a woman to lust for her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And we can internalize all the commandments in that way. What am I saying? What I'm saying is, with my friend who was so freaked out about that one sin thing, if Adam was kicked out of the garden for one sin, then what are we going to do with Axel? Right? And what are we going to do with me? And what are you going to do with you? Because you have a lot more sins than one sin. 
Adam was rejected from the presence of God for breaking the contract once. What about a person like you who breaks the contract once before he even gets out of bed in the morning? What if we added up all of your sins according to the law of God? You'd be in a bad place. Um, many more sins than Adam. And you might say to yourself, yeah, but um, you know, there's mitigating circumstances or, or surely God has a better, you know, more merciful disposition. Well, God will never just sweep stuff under the carpet. He just, he just doesn't do that. I do that. You might do it. Uh, but God will never do that. In other words, if there's a crime, someone has to do the time. And, you know, we could talk more about that next week. Is that really a fair standard that every, everything in the divine books have to be completely balanced in the end? I think you'll know that, yes, it, it is fair. But we could talk about having to pay for sins. Even uh, in relationships, we have to pay for sins. Just, just a quick example. Um, suppose, you know, Anna and I are just, just starting to get to know each other. And um, Axel says, oh, yeah, I saw you talking to that uh, young woman. W what's her name? Anna. And I say, yeah, she's from Lakeland. Right? And then I, I said, oh, we hate Lakeland, which I don't. We, we, I, I actually lived there for three years, four years. And then Anna hears about, hears me, like, you know, she doesn't, I don't, realize but she's right behind the door and then she opens the door and she looks at me and says tj were you just talking about my hometown and you know maybe i said a bunch of other really bad stuff about anna and then i say anna i am so sorry i was really bad would you forgive me she says all right and then like a couple weeks later she runs into bonnie in the supermarket and bonnie says um Oh, how long have you lived here? Where are you from, Lakeland? Oh, I think I've seen you before, haven't I? Yeah, well, I, I go to the church across the street. And then Bonnie says, oh, I have a long friendship with TJ. And then Anna's thinking, get it? If she bites her tongue at that moment, she's kind of paying for my sin because there's a feeling that you get within you that says, yeah, tell Bonnie yeah, I know, TJ. He's a gossip and a slanderer. Like, everything in you wants to say that, but you have to push that down, and you kind of die a death when you do that. And so you, in this case, Anna, is paying for my sin. You get it? And so all sin really does have to be paid for. I'm not just talking about a Christian way of looking at things or a Bible way of looking at things. All sins really do get paid for. And God will look at Josh and say, Josh, I made this covenant in the beginning. It wasn't just like off the top of my head. You know, T.J. Campo writes with a dry marker board so that he can erase it. God writes in stone because he doesn't have to erase it. He's had all eternity to think about it. And God says to all of us, I made this covenant with humanity at the very beginning. Adam broke it one time. And to show that it was really broken, I sent him out of the garden and did not allow him to come in. If you don't have this, you will not have this. You get, you get what I'm saying? If you don't have a record of perfect obedience, you will not live. Now, you might be looking at me and saying, TJ, you told us that you sometimes sin before you get out of bed, which I do. And you told us last week that you're a bad driver and that Missy is sometimes afraid to drive with you, which is true, right? So why could you possibly think that you are up here and not down here? And the reason I know that is because I have a friend, he's actually my attorney, who lived a perfect life and then died a sacrificial death on my behalf. And this person live by all the laws of God. Sometimes I can obey the laws of God, you know, like this. He obeyed the laws of God, you know, like a dance. For him, it was like a choreographed, beautiful dance that came right out of his own heart. It was never something forced. 
The only time it was apparently forced was when his obedience was going to require him to be separated from the one with whom he had perfect harmony from all eternity. And at that point he said, if it's possible, make this cup pass from me. But that was the only time where we ever saw any wavering in Jesus. And the wavering, even at that point, was only because he didn't want to be separated from the Father that he loved from all eternity. Because Jesus Christ lived the life I should have lived, I'm credited with that. In other words, what I'm telling you is, if God were to look at my record, he would see 100% perfect obedience. He's like, TJ, how can you say that? You said you sinned before you get out of bed. I know. My junk, my sins have been accounted to Jesus or have been attributed to Jesus as if he sinned them. He played the criminal so that I could be counted as a son. You get it? He lived the life I should have lived and died the death that I deserved to die. And because of that, he trades record with me. Sometimes uh, theologians call it the great exchange. All of my junk is attributed to him. All of his beauty, goodness, and obedience is attributed to me. And that is the apostles' teaching. That is the good news of the Christian faith. That grace has triumphed over judgment. That the favor of God that comes to us for free intersects the circle of karma. You know what karma is? When you do something, it comes back on you, which is true. I mean, that, that stuff happens, except God and his grace has intersected karma and broken the cycle of karma. All right? So that's the good news. How do you get it? How do you get the good news? Martin Luther, and Bonnie's Lutheran, I always give her a nod when I, when I quote him. Martin Luther said in his commentary to the Galatians, or commentary to the letter to the Galatians, he said, grace, I'm sorry, faith receives grace. By the way, if you people in this class will memorize that one phrase, faith receives grace, you'll be miles ahead of super mature Christians. Yes. Um, I had kind of like a semantic question about yeah. the questions on the card. Yes. So, but do you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven? Yes. Or that your behavior allows you to go to heaven? And I put, like, I don't know anything for sure. I put that I have faith that I can give that belief that Jesus was the Son of God. Okay, so, that, so you're, the, the question has to do with faith and knowledge. It says, do you know for sure? But I feel like we can't ever really know for sure. We have to have faith. Okay. All right, and we can talk about that. That's, a, that's an epistemological question, and I know you're a philosophy lover. So epistemology is the science of knowledge. You know, what, how do we know something is true or not? Is faith a reliable organ uh, for, not, for gaining knowledge? That's, that's the question. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you about it today. All right, so um, where was I? Yes, I'm sorry. Faith, listen, listen to this, please. This really is a jewel. I, I'm, I've met so many Christians, including me. I think I went all the way through seminary and I wouldn't have been able to answer this question. What is the organ of reception for grace? Let me put it another way. What is the organ of reception for food? Stomach or the mouth, the digestive tract. What is the organ of reception for sound waves? The ears. What is the organ of reception for oxygen? Lungs. What is the organ of reception for grace? Faith. Okay? And that's, that's what I'm saying. So many people don't get that. The way you get grace, and you want to know where it's taught, at the very center of one of the most revolutionary books that has ever be, been written. It's only six chapters long. It's called The Letter to the Galatians. Right in the middle of it, Paul says, let me blow away all the dust and tell you the main point of what I'm trying to say here. This is the only thing I want to know. This is how he puts it. This is the only thing I want to know. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law or by hearing with faith? And he says, obviously, it's not by the law. The law put us here. Right? The only way you get 
the grace of God is by faith. How do you get the grace of God? Faith. Believing. All right? Believing is like breathing. Just remember it that way. Believing is like breathing. All right? Martin Luther said, grace is received by faith in the same way rain is received by the grass. Have you ever noticed that when it starts to get really dry, grass moves around and starts calling the rain down from heaven? Have you ever noticed that? Have you? I mean, I've never seen gra grass do anything to get the rain. You get it? Grass receives the rain passively, and faith receives grace passively. It's a gift, right? We don't get it. We don't earn it. We don't pray our way to it. We don't give our way to it. We don't do good stuff to get it. We just soak it in, all right? We get grace the way the, rain, the, way the grass gets rain, passively, and that's what faith is all about. All right, next week, some more talk. Any more uh, questions or comments or thoughts about grace, about the gospel? All right, next week we'll talk about how do you know you, get, you have grace? All right, that's a pretty important question. All right, let me, let me pray for you, then I'll let you go. Thank you, Lord, that we're together now, and we pray that we would um, soak in your grace today and that your grace would find us out and that our hearts, our souls, would be like well-watered gardens because by faith we've received your truth and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.